Amen. Well, guys, would you grab a Bible and open up to the book of Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, that is where we're going to be tonight. Wednesday nights, we make our way through the Bible, working through uh, just chapter by chapter, uh, working back, back and forth between new and old. And so this is where we are, uh, making our way through this book. And we just want to invite you into that. If you have a Bible, you made your way there, great. If you need a Bible, uh, there are Bibles in front of you, page number on the screen. You want to use electronic device, we just want to bless that, again, for the Bible. I mean, you don't want to be distracted with everything else, uh, but we invite you to that, uh, just in a space of being in the Word and longing that God would speak to you through His Word uh, this evening. And so that true here, that true in the overflow, online, watching later, we just invite you to the Word of God. We want you to hear with us, see with us uh, what God is speaking. And so with that just held out before us, let's ask Him for help that he would open up his word in a real and powerful way to us tonight. Father, you're good, and I thank you for that. I thank you for your word, and that you tell us everything. Everything necessary for life and godliness, you've given us in your word. That you tell us that all scripture is inspired by you, so that through it, we could be complete equipped for every good work. And we're just, I'm amazed by that. I'm in awe of that. I, I love how succinct in many ways and full and powerful your word is. God, we come tonight and believing that, ask that you would speak through your word to us, right where we are. We're different people in different situations. And that would make that difficult if you weren't so able to take your truth and, and weave it right to where we are. So I trust you in that. I'm asking for that. By your strength, by your power, would you make it so right now? We trust you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So a good meal uh, so often flows off of a good recipe. I know it's a simple beginning, but I want you just to think about it right now. Uh, you, you think about it, those who are good cooks, and I'm just going to own it right now. I'm using this as an illustration. I am not. My wife is, uh, and so I can borrow from that. But those who are, you, you know how that works. I mean, if you're making a meal, you know the, the things that you would throw into that to make a good meal. In fact, for some of you, you're the kind of person that could sit down at a meal, and you'd be, sit there, and you're like, hmm, I know what's in this. Like, I can taste this, or they have a little bit of this, and they have a little bit of that. And you can be so aware of what's making uh, something that would just flow into something that would taste good. It really does take having the right ingredients to have a good meal. It takes having the right ingredients in the right measure that would feed and pull into a good meal. And that illustration I want to just begin with because in many ways, Song of Solomon becomes this for us. It becomes this letter, this uh, letter here that we have, sometimes called the Song of Solomon, sometimes the Song of Songs. We talked about that a little bit last week. But we get in this book, what we would simply want to hold out to you tonight is a recipe. A recipe for what God intends uh, love to look like, what God intends uh, love to, to take place. And as we think about that, we talked about this a little bit last week, and if you missed that, you can catch it online but we find it having two very distinct and yet very powerful applications. On one hand, uh, we get a biblical book that helps us understand God's plan for marriage, uh, God's hand, uh, plan for husbands and wives, and this essential and this amazing thing that the world has twisted, uh, that the world has taken the good gifts of God and, and twisted them away from that. And so we get a good measure from God saying, hey, this is what I intended it to be, and that's good for us. Uh, it's good for us here. Uh, we have a lot of married couples here this evening. That would be good for you. Uh, we have singles here this evening, both uh, who ha are, are, are young or those who are, you know, for our, our widows in those spaces, and yet it still finds itself helpful because understanding God's plan not only helps orient us in the midst of His world and, and His plan, but then it does the far better thing. God tells us if you can see it, if you can see His intention for marriage, then you get a glimpse into what he, the kind of relationship that he wants to have with his people, the relationship that Jesus has with his church. It tells us this in Ephesians 5, that, that we have this great mystery that both understanding God's plan and this then unpacks for us our relationship with God. So here's the deal. 
I don't know how tonight's going to land for you. Hopefully it'll be helpful for some of the couples, some of it helpful in the way that we're thinking it through, but for all of us, if we can see it, then we're going to be drawn to some ingredients that truly help us in our relationship with Jesus and help us understand what that is. And certainly, as we're here in chapter 2, those are the things that we want to speak through. So here's what we're going to do. Same thing we did last week. We're going to spend the first part of our time talking about the relationship between a husband and wife, and then we're going to flip. Uh, we're going to flip midway through and take the same realities and then talk about how they picture uh, that relationship we have with Jesus. So as we begin that, why don't you join me there in chapter 2, and it just begins this way. Verse 1, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Like a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Like an apple tree among the, the trees of wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. One of the lessons we learn, and we already have seen it, and we're going to see it a bunch more times, is that this relationship that God has de designed for us, one of the things that's a key ingredient into making that everything it is, is words. I mean, we find words, words being spoken back and forth uh, between the wife, between the husband, way that they're responding. And one of the things we learn, it's a simple lesson, but it's more profound than words can, uh, can quickly unpack for us. When we think about words, they're so key in relationships, they're so key in love, they're powerful for good or evil. I like the way it tells it to us in Proverbs, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Words, words, they can create life, and they can create death, and that is true in a marriage, and that is true in a relationship. So often the words that are spoken Harsh words, unkind words, they, 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 are, they are destructive. Make no mistake, they're, they're not something to be taken lightly. To, to, to be, very clearly should be one of those things that we recognize are, are not meant to be there. That we look upon it and recognize so much better to hold a tongue, so much better to hold back because rash words spoken can be just, they're painful. They tear at the fabric uh, of what a relationship would be. At the same moment, we just get a picture of good words. And again, it flew back, it flowed back and forth. I just read it without the uh, indications of who was reading. And we talked about this a tiny bit last week. In the actual Hebrew, it doesn't tell us who's speaking. Uh, and so if you have the New King James, it might say like Shulamite or the Beloved. Uh, that's just the New King James throwing it in there. We do know that it's a feminine when it's put the Shulamite. We're just going to say wife. Uh, we do know it's singular man uh, when it's the beloved speaking. We also have crowds or people speaking. And so again, it's just always who's speaking, and yet it flows kind of simply as this conversation. And, and we begin just with these words from the Shulamite. We, then we see the beloved respond, and she responds back to it. And one of the things we want to just quickly highlight is that both the power of words, but even a little bit their difference. Husbands, uh, we want to hold out to you again that God's intention uh, is simple, that he's inviting you for your words to convey love and for wives. He's inviting you for your words uh, to convey honor and respect. We think about it, we talk about it often and worthy that it's so, and again, we did last week, but there in Ephesians 5, when God is unpacking what marriage looks like, he says to husbands, nevertheless, let each one of you in particular, so love his own wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. God is so simple. I mean, he makes it just one word, uh, that one word that would filter everything. And one of the powerful realities, if you can take these words, you see it all the way through the Song of Solomon. You see the way that they flow, that, that the, the wife speaks this honor and respect, and, and, and the husband speaks these words of love, and, and you watch that play out in a way that is that. And so certainly one of the things is just to recognize this. Uh, their language is different. I mean, so I'm not asking that you would go home and use these words identically in your marriage. That probably wouldn't go well for you. Uh, it's a different culture. But your intention should be the same. It is a space of communicating love. We notice how it begins there in verse 1. She is speaking, and she says, I'm a rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Quick FYI, um, we really do know that it's her speaking in the Hebrew. It's very clear that it, it's singular and feminine, and yet it's kind of an odd thing. Over history, uh, sometimes, well, I won't even track with it how it all got there, 
uh, somehow these words got uh, kind of put into the, 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 the idea that it would be speaking from the husband and more that it would be speaking from Christ. And so some of you all recognize there's hymns and there's uh, things that would say, you know, of Christ, that he is the Rose of Sharon, that he is the Lily of the Valleys. And I just want to say, hey, Christ is amazing and worthy that you see everything that he's good. But there's just, that's not here. I mean, that's not what this is. In fact, it wouldn't actually fit. Uh, because the idea here is she's speaking, and much like she spoke in chapter 1, it's a little bit self-depreciating. The idea where she says here, I'm a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys, uh, isn't speaking of some beautiful flower. Um, it's speaking of, you know, flowers that are along the side of the road. I mean, it's just this, I'm this flower that's in the valleys. I mean, you know, you, you drive between here and Rio or whatever, and you just look out there and you'll see some flowers. And she's like, that's me. I'm just, I'm just this common, uh, no, nondescript, I mean, not anything that would st step out, not anything that would be, I'm just, I'm just this, not rose, I mean, we use the word rose, and so you might be picturing this like, you know, beautiful red rose. Again, it's not that. It is, again, really more of a purple flower uh, that's found throughout Israel, but it's just found everywhere. And it's just, that's all I am. I'm just, I mean, she is looking at this, and she uh, is kind of responding to a little bit that we saw last week, and She's just thinking, I don't, I don't feel special. I feel common. I, I, I feel like one among a million. I feel like just, you know, that you could get lost in the midst of it, and he responds well. He says, like a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. The challenge uh, for you men who are husbands here this evening specifically is to figure out um, how to communicate to your wife in a way that she knows she's loved. Uh, it tells us in, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, speaking about it, it says, husbands, love your wives with understanding. Um, and it has this idea of figuring out how they work and, and, and what you're speaking to them in a way that they would understand that. And uh, if I can say this very quickly and kindly, um, women have this feminine mystique that it changes. So as soon as you think you figure it out, it's going to change, and you're going to have to keep trying to figure it out, which is part of the excitement of marriage. It's like, how do I make you know? I, I, I want to communicate to you in a way that you would know that. And so what he does is he lets us know he's listening. She's called herself a lily. He says, okay, you're a lily, but everybody else is a thorn. I mean, you, if you're a lily, then everything else in comparison to you is a prickly you know, thorn. You you know, are a lily that stands out far above everything else that's there. And he's able just to communicate both his affection, uh, but also just he heard her. I mean, he, he, did, he actually listened to what she said and, and addressed where she was and, and is able to say, no, you are so much different than this. And, and therein lies your call, men, to answer in a way that causes the woman that you love know that she is singularly uh, just beautiful and, and, and special to you. This lily is among the thorns, so is my love among the daughters. She then turns, and she speaks to him. And it's interesting that, again, she's speaking very loving words, but they are just tinged with respect. Uh, she says, you're like this apple tree among the trees of the wood. I mean, you are strong, and you are this one that is vibrant and has life. Uh, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade. And with great delight, his fruit was sweet to my taste. She, she speaks of, of his singular kind of just acceptable and yet said how much beautiful. And she speaks honor and she speaks uh, delight in who he is in a way that recognizes uh, his strength and, and just his provision that, again, meets that in a powerful way. It's worth just hearing. It's worth just hearing and just saying therein lies a huge challenge. It's an amazing thing just to realize how powerful words are. And so we've seen it. We're going to see it more and more throughout the Song of Solomon where they just communicate in a way that seeks to communicate love, and so should you. Value words. It's a huge part of God's design in the midst of this. As we watch these words take place, it then changes a little bit. And for simplicity, I'm going to say it this way. It's love that's displayed in public. Notice with me how it says it says, he brought me uh, to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. He stopped there just for a moment. So the idea is 
this banqueting house. And I don't think that's a hard thing for you to even imagine, even though cultures change. I mean, a banqueting house is where you are having, you're having a party. I mean, you've got a bunch of people. It's, it's time for a banquet. I mean, you're inviting uh, anybody, you know, whatever that would be that's being represented or celebrated. I mean, if it's a banquet, it's a big deal. And, and people are there. And she's been brought into this place. And so now this couple is together in public. Now they're, they're together in the midst of this. And one of the things we want to gaze on this is how much that kind of treating each other in public affects uh, just the life that takes place uh, behind the scenes. It affects that, that, that romance, it affects that relationship. How you present each other is incredibly powerful. Um, husbands, your challenge. It is that one word, right? Ephesians 5. To present her as loved, uh, to present her that it, it's as if, you know, when you, when, where she is, it's marked that way. And so he gives it to us in this unreal, it's not a real picture, it didn't actually happen this way, but almost in this imaginary understanding that he says, okay, he brought me into the banqueting house and you could have put a banner over me. Uh, you could have put a sign over me that says, I'm loved. I mean, I, I, I'm loved. I mean, it's not something, again, you would actually do. I mean, it would actually kind of be silly and maybe a little bit different that way. Uh, it, it, you know, but the idea of a banner would be both a declaration. Uh, sometimes banners were even used in military congress to say, hey, this is what I'm fighting for. This is what I'm showing. And it's as if he's placed this over her, so she's in public, and it's as if there's this sign, this pointing down. It says, she is loved. Uh, she, that, that I love her, and he wants everybody to know that. He, he wants everybody uh, to see that in a way. And so she says, he's placed this banner over me. He's placed this banner over me, with, which, which is this incredible love that, that is there, uh, that again, she just knows it. In fact, she responds to it uh, and, and says that she's thinking about this, this sign uh, over her in a sense that says, hey, I'm loved. Uh, she declares that that's exactly what she feels. Uh, she says... She responds and she says, sustain me uh, with cakes of raisins, refresh me with apples, because I am lovesick. I'm in love. I mean, she is able to look on this, and, and she, she is responding in a way that has made this out. And again, she just declares it, that in many ways, he's made her feel the way that God has intended that she feels loved. Uh, she feels treasured. She feels honored. And, and so in the midst of this, there's a beautiful place of this understanding. Now, as we're thinking about this, let me see if I can kind of unpack it this direction. Um, we are imperfect people. Like, we're broken. And so there's not anybody in this room uh, that is not. Uh, there's not any marriage in this room that you're doing it perfectly well. But here's the thing, when we're talking about this kind of public uh, presentation of your marriage, that's stuff to keep at home. That's stuff that you deal with a a as a couple in public before anybody else. No. She just says, I feel loved. Uh, he loves me. And, and it it's, it's a space where that is incredibly presented and, and known. And it's just worth you hearing. It goes back the other direction, by the way, wives. You know, she, we're, you're meant to present him in a way that honors him and respects him. And so she'll say it this way in verse 6. His left hand is under my head. His right hand embraces me. There's not anything in here that, in, the, in this saying here, that is uh, private. This isn't one of those pictures that's speaking of, uh, of intimacy. We're going to see that later in the chapter. Right now, she's in public. Uh, she's telling everybody, and what she's describing is who he is. She's saying to him, you know, he, he holds me. His left hand is upholding me, and his right hand is embracing me. It's, it's this picture of her husband's strength, uh, or of her husband's arms, and it is fully complimentary. It's a way of describing him as a really good man. Uh, and saying, he's a good man. I mean, he's a good man. He takes care of me, and he protects me, and he upholds me. And, and he is this one who, who embraces me. I mean, it's a description that she is saying of him in public. Again, it's incredibly honoring. A space where she just speaks of that strength, uh, of that tenderness of who he is. 
In fact, she turns it and says, I charge you. Verse 7, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by, uh, or by the does of the field, do not stir or awaken love until it pleases. So this is a really fascinating phrase. In fact, it's used twice. It's used here, uh, and it's used in, in chapter 8. And it probably has a, a couple of connotations. In one sense, uh, she is saying, hey, if you could see what love is, don't try to create a, a counterfeit. Uh, don't try to make this happen and somebody else wait for it. I mean, when you see what God made for this, um, speaking to you, especially speaking to some of you tonight, that you are matchmakers, um, hey, don't force it. Uh, don't, 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 don't try to, because this is good. This is really, really good. And, and you don't want to uh, pretend. You don't want to create a counterfeit. Don't do it because this real deal is really, really good. So, I mean, that's part of what's happening in this verse. It's part of what's going to happen in chapter 8. But let's come back to it again, because actually it's still found in this public presentation. And she is still just singing his praises. I mean, in one sense, she's declaring how good this is. Like, hey, my husband, he makes me feel so loved. And hey, you, 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 you should want, I mean, this is really good. He's a good man, and he creates this space. And so she's speaking almost to the, to the ladies, as if the, you know, the, the ladies are all gathered at the dessert table, or I don't know, maybe it's not the dessert table, maybe it's the salad table, okay? It's over at the salad table, and they're having this conversation, and she's just like, man, ladies, it's just it's really good. My husband's, he, I, I, he's kind, he's, you know, I just, you, you, you should want this for your young ladies. You should want all that this is. You should look upon this that would be, in this sense, the daughters of Jerusalem, but, you know, don't stir it because it's so good, and yet it speaks of just her encouragement into the midst of it. And so, again, I just want you to almost feel it. Again, culture's changed. We don't do it the same way. You don't have to speak these words, but I'm just going to ask you, Hey, Grace, where right now you would feel like, oh, I didn't do that like yesterday, you know, um, then undo it. I mean, just from this point forward, I just want to encourage you married couples here this evening. Hey, present your spouse in the best possible light. Speak of them in honor. Speak of them in love. Don't tear them down. It's a weird thing. I just don't know if people always get this. And sometimes that happens even when the, when the, the, when the other you know, partner is, is in the same room. And I've watched it. I've literally watched it across the room here in this building. Uh, when I've watched a couple and maybe one of the spouses begins to make fun uh, of their spouse, like, he is such a turkey. Like, I just want to tell you, like, he can't seem to get any. I mean, I mean she just begins to say words and I can watch his countenance. I can watch him just like, you know, without even really doing it. But I've also seen the other. I've seen others when times they're speaking, they're like, oh, yeah, good man. Good. She's, she's a great woman, you know. And, and I, I can watch them. Just, I mean, a little bit of shame, a little bit embarrassed, but in one sense, it's, it's just absolutely life-giving. And, and, and that all by itself becomes a little bit a part of, uh, of this place, that, uh, that protecting of one another, because it is protection, because we're going to admit it again, we know better. One of the things that happens in marriage, and I'm trying again just to think about how to say this really well. Um, God knows you perfectly, but in this world, your spouse is probably next. Like, if anybody knows you, it's the person that spends day after day with you. And here's the deal. They know you're not perfect. They know you're not perfect. And they could tear you down. I mean, they could. I mean, they, they, could, they could tell things that would, and, and, and yet to be that person that puts a protection, that, that says, no, you know, you are safe with me, uh, and, and, and my love, my honor covers you in, in a space. It is an incredible thing that builds relationship, uh, that only creates a greater sense uh, of coming together. So just hear it clearly. It's not a minor part. It's still a part of these words that are speaking, but it's very specifically words that are spoken in public. All right. Well, we'll leave that for time's sake. So we have words, we have how it's done in public, but then we get this idea of some getaways. Uh, that's really what's found next. In fact, I'll just read it through a little bit. And so you have uh, the, the wife, the Shulamite speaking there in verse eight, and she says, the voice of my beloved. Behold, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, skipping on the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle. Or a young stag, again, just filled with compliment, filled with honor, kind of just of who he is. 
Behold, he stands behind our wall, looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, winter is past, and the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, and the time of singing has come. And the voice of the turtle dove is put it is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth her green leaves. The vines, the tender grapes, give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one. Oh, come away. I want to talk about getaways just for a moment, and, and yet I really think it's probably more powerful than I could probably describe, but it's put here in that culture. So just for time's sake, I'm just going to launch it straight into our culture. Hey, spouses, you should date your spouse. And you should absolutely date your spouse. That's not something just that should take place in the pursuit or that place of, of pursuing marriage. There ought to be a space where you find spaces regularly, weekly if possible, uh, to have time together. Life is different, and there's not a, a one-size-fits-all for this, but you should find space that would fill what we're going to talk about here in a moment that provide those spaces. But then on top of it, you should find getaways romantic getaways, because that's actually what this is. You have this, you know, this man is saying, let's get away. Come away. Let, let, you know, it's a beautiful season. The winter's past. Everything's blooming. We should go. We should go up into the mountains. We should go up and see the flowers. Like, we should go. And he's inviting her to this getaway. And I would like to take a moment to say that I find that to be a very both biblically and then hold it out a little bit from our lives, not as anybody who's doing perfectly, uh, but I do want to hold it. So let me give you just four things that uh, we see in this passage that I think become helpful. So the first is you just want to find a good space for that. So we get this great description. You know, you get this whole space where he, he describes both the timing of the season, the flowers are there, uh, the fig trees are there, and obviously it's something that he both finds uh, just fun and beautiful, and he's inviting her into that same space, a place where uh, they could just find that place to connect and, and connect and, and, and reconnect in deeper ways. And I just want to tell you, one of the beautiful things is we're different people. And there is not a one size fits all, but you should find yours. Uh, couples here this evening, you should find yours. You should find spaces that would be like, hey, this is our space. Um, if it's, you know, for, for my wife and I, it's the mountains. Like if we can go up to Rio Doso, Cloudcroft, somewhere in Colorado, and, and away from everything, that's great for us. For somebody else, it's going to be like, no, I want to be out on like a farm somewhere, or I want to be, we're going to go camping. Or, and, and someone here this evening is like, no, no, I want to go to a big city. <laughs> like I want to go someplace where we can be catered, and, you know, we're just going to, we're going to, we're going to, there's not a wrong answer in this, but there is a space that you should have your spaces. You should have your spaces where you can find that just gives you opportunity to connect. And I think it would be just easier for me to give you the second one and talk about that one a little bit more. What's the aim? Well, he tells us. He says there in verse 14, Oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. Uh, your voice is sweet. Your face is lovely. The aim of this is connecting. It is communication. It is to see each other, to know each other, to talk, and to listen. It is a place where those words and those places, they happen and it flows together. And that just might make perfect sense to you, but I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, I don't know how we did it. I don't think we're that smart, but we learned from the get-go. Uh, this is 39 years uh, of marriage for us, but we learned from the very beginning the value of getaways. Uh, probably from almost the beginning. We've done it. Not perfectly, probably. There's probably been a season we've missed one or two. But for the most part, we usually get away twice a year. Uh, just twice a year, even just for a day, uh, to, to do this. Um, but early on, we aimed at having fun. Like the goal was like, let's gonna, we're going to go to the movies, and we're going to go to miniature golf, and we're going to go bowling, and we're going to... I mean, we just wanted to do things. And I don't know how long it took us to figure out, it's like, that's not actually the point. We want to talk. Um, and, and so we just kind of learned. We, we learned lessons that were good for us. Uh, for us, it just works best if we can have one full day. It means two nights away because it means, hey, we're going to go somewhere, and then we're going to wake up, and the whole day, the whole day is just ours. And we just want to talk. You know, we sit at restaurants longer than we'd sit at other times, and we'll walk. 
Uh, we love long walks in the mountains, or we'll take a long scenic drive, or we'll just sit on a porch if we get someplace that's there. But the whole goal is just to talk. I mean, just to talk. Now, again, I'm just going to try to be as honest as I can. I wish I could tell you that every time we've done that, it's been really, really effective. Now, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes we talk, but we just don't ever get that level of communication that you know you need. Um, but we pursue it every time. Uh, we know that's what we're after. We're after uh, knowing each other. And, and how are you? Like, where are you? I just want to see you. I, just want, I want to see where you are. I want to understand what's, how you're, what's going on. And we just want to talk. And, and, and so and it just, it often, but that's what we're pursuing. We're pursuing that kind of thing. And I'm just inviting you. Hey, couples, you need this. You need it weekly. You need dates where you could just sit down and Again, life's different. For some of you, you have young kids, and so you got to be really inventive. I mean, I think early on in our marriage, we were like, you know, the kids went to bed, and we, you know, we did that. And even when the kids got a little bit older and they were there, we had these spaces where we played like a game because, you know, it, is, it would help us to communicate. In fact, if I'm being just blatantly honest, if I can say, one of the things we learned about communication is I'm one of the weak points. And, and so if I can just be honest with you, just sitting and talking, um, my mind wanders. And it just, is that, is that bad? I mean, I'm just trying to be honest with you. Uh, and, and so it just does, and I'm not really, so we just learned, hey, if we play a game, you know, we play, used to play backgammon. We took out all the competitive rules, because that's mean. And uh, we just wanted to roll the dice and move the things. That's all we wanted to do. Or we take a walk. Or, but it really helps, because you're just doing a little bit. And we do, but we've tried to figure out, like, what produces that? What kind of things create environment for us to be able to talk. Sometimes it's drive. Sometimes, I mean, again, and it's changed over the seasons, but we know what we want. And I'm just trying to tell you, you want that. You want to have somebody that knows you and you're communicating. Uh, and, and that can only be done by regularly doing that. You can't just do this once every 10 years. It, it needs to be a regular space in life that you're like, okay, we do this. And so for us, we do that. And when we get away, when we get away for those things, it's just us. Uh, we're not visiting anybody. We're not seeing any friends. We're not seeing any family. I mean, we're in this space that, you know, our kids are out. But, you know, when we go there, we're like, there's no FaceTime. We're not answering the phone. Like, this, this is, you know, like, we just tell our kids, like, for the next 36 hours, we are out of touch, you know, because this is our space. Like, we're just going to have space. And, and that regular kind of thing is so helpful. So that's what's happening here. He says, let's just go get away. I'm going to go up in the mountains. We're going to go up in the cleft of the rocks. And I just want to see you and I want to hear your voice. And then they talk about what it's going to do. So keep going. So they, they do this and they say, catch us, uh, verse 15, the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. So the New King James says, this is her brothers. Uh, that's not actually in the text. We don't know it. We just know it's plural. In fact, it's not even one that's telling us that it's male or female. It's just plural. Uh, so I'm just going to toss it out to you. I think it's them. I think they're talking to each other. I don't think it's one talking to I think this is the couple saying this. And what they're saying is, hey, you know what? Let's catch the little foxes. Let's deal with the problems while they're small. Let's deal with the things uh, as they crop up. Let's, let's deal with the little things that would undermine our relationship. Let's catch these foxes that would spoil the vine. Let's, let's deal with this while they're small and they're tender. And this becomes one of the powerful realities. That if you'll do this, if you will have dates and if you'll have getaways, your goal is to deal with the problems why they're small. Many times marriage counseling. When people come in to talk to us here at the church, or we get them connected to somebody else uh, within our community, which we do both of those. Um, but I can tell you this, many times it's because for some of these couples, it's been five years. It's been 10 years. And they've had problems. And these little things that started small are big. They're big. And they could have been, you know, they can be fixed. God can heal. But they could have been fixed a long time ago. And a marriage done right is constantly maintaining that, constantly saying, "Hey, let's 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 just let's continue. Let's like let's talk. Let's get rid of things. Let's let's deal with things, whether small. It needs to happen. It's so incredibly powerful." And he lays that out here, and I do for you as well. Then in verse sixteen and seventeen, there is this picture of intimacy. There's this place where they give space to it. Verse seven, sixteen: My beloved is mine; I am his. He feeds his flock among the lilies. 
until the day breaks or the shadows flew away. Turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the mountains of Bethel. So very quickly, we're going to talk about it in a different way. He's probably talking about intimacy here. I mean, it, there's a lot of different things within the, the midst of this, but we probably are talking about physical intimacy. And I want to delay it here because it's very possible that it's still found in this idea of getaways. But I also want to separate because it's also possible as we get to the end of the chapter that he's telling us everything we've talked about is flowing to this, having good communication, you know, having good words, being this care in public, and, and these getaways provide this space for physical intimacy, which God's designed, which he has for our lives. As we quickly think about this, I want to just try to say this carefully. I think that's what this describes. It's very poetic. It's some similar words that will be used uh, throughout Song of Solomon. But I love how beautifully vague and and careful God words it. So I'm going to try to say it this way. I'm not going to undo anything that he's doing. I'm not going to try to be coarse or or, or crude over any of this. I just want you to feel it. I just want you to feel it, that there's this intimate that is uh, both physical and emotional, and it begins with this, this statement. In fact, maybe the key one in this picture of probably intimacy found in the Song of Solomon is this full commitment. Uh, this place that she just begins it and says, he's mine, and I'm his. My beloved's mine. Like, he is mine, and I am his. That's a powerful statement of belonging, uh, of commitment, this place where you would say, hey, this is who I am, this is who we are, saying it even in a different way. It is this idea of exclusivity uh, that it's only theirs to share. This is what God intends. God created intimacy. God, it was God's good design, but it was meant for marriage. It was meant for marriage. And, and in its space, it's meant to be this place that there's a couple who would say, I am fully yours, and you are fully mine. And and this is not something we share with anybody else. This is not a piece of our life that anybody else has it. In fact, when God talks about immorality um, and talks about people, he would often picture it saying it in the Proverbs like it's stolen water. Uh, It's stealing what doesn't belong to you. Uh, It's taking something that's that's destructive, and, and it's ugly in that sense. It twists it out of its good room. But where it's right, it's this place of total belonging. And there's something so powerful in that. There's something in the midst of this where she's able just to look at this and says, hey, there's nothing separating. In fact, go and see it again. Talking about this space they give to it until the day breaks or the shadows flee away. Turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the mountains of Bethel. So very quickly, that's an interesting description that Bible scholars are uncertain. There is no mountain. Uh, of Bethel and Israel. There's not like, well, that's okay. That's what he's talking about. We're going to go and hang out in the Pecos Mountains. No, that's not it. I mean, there's nothing that's not it. It literally means division. Uh, it literally means uh, a separation. It's used in Genesis when uh, God you know, talks about the cutting of a sacrifice, so that you'd, you'd cut them. You, there would be a dividing down the middle. And so there is a sense here that the idea is you know, just o- overcoming all of that. Everything where there's distance, everything where there's separation, part of what's celebrated in intimacy is absolutely that, and it's part of what makes it beautiful. So let me come back and try to say it this way. I love the way the Hebrew speaks to us. He says, marriage is honorable among all, and the bed is undefiled. But if fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Marriage is great, and intimacy The marriage bed, that's a gift from God. That's a gift that he gave. And and there's not anything unholy about that. There's not anything wrong. It's a beautiful thing. It should be celebrated. But twisting it out of that, adultery, fornication, those are destructive. That's taking a good gift from God and messing it up. And so here's where I want to just speak to you. I, I would love if I could say, hey, this evening that we're all in the right place on this, but probably not. Some of you have had a sordid past. Some of you still struggle. And I just want to invite you away from destruction. I want to invite you away from those things which rob, kill, and destroy. And, and taking God's good gifts out of marriage, uh, taking that and seeing it in any other way out of that, that's destructive to your soul. And it's destructive to your relationship. It's destructive to everything God has. And God died for our sin to, to rescue us from that. And we invite you to be rescued. We invite you to be rescued. But then I invite you to step towards it. For married couples here this evening to recognize, no, this is a good thing. 
Like we want to be in this place where we are we're known, where we see each other, where we're talking, where there's nothing that separates us. And that becomes both word and experience in just a wonderful place of celebrating all that that is. So it helps us just feel uh, that which God has for us. All right, well, I'm going to leave that there because we need to quickly turn. And so we've walked it through. We've seen a picture of marriage. We've seen it in words and public and getaways. We've seen it in intimacy, good designs, good kind of environment for what God has. Let's quickly flip it. I meant to get there more quickly. I need to get better about that, but I'm going to do it as quick as I can. But hang with me for a few moments. We think about everything that's here, and we now get this chance to see what God intends for us in Christ. And what we find is it's actually the same. We find that it's in words that words are key. They're key in love. They're key in relationships. They're powerful. But we find ourselves needing to hear God speak to us, describing how he sees us. Much like the, uh, the, the wife at the beginning in chapter of the verse one that she's like, I just feel so, poor, so, so just, just plain, so ordinary. And yet he would have this that speaks, no, I see you as valuable. I, I see you a, a, as mine, as a child of God. And we, we get to hear how God speaks of us. We need to hear that. We need to hear it. That's in the Word of God. That's in the Word of God speaks to us, but then we need to speak it. That when we speak this, it really is words. For us, it's prayer. For us, it's worship. But there's something powerful. Man, I don't know if you've discovered this. I hope you have, so I'm only saying what you know. Sometimes when you're praying the right things and you're worshiping the right things, it doesn't create those things, but it causes them to come to life. Hey, it's true in actually marriage as well. Sometimes just saying it, turning and saying, I love you. I mean, I I cherish you. It didn't create it, but somehow it gives it wings. It gives it power. It it resonates life in it. And sometimes just coming into God's presence and just speaking, God, I love you. God, I'm so thankful for who you are. God, I worship you. And and just allowing that, sometimes grabbing hold of a worship song, it just, it does something as words are beginning to flow towards him. It becomes power and it becomes power in our life and rightly so. But it also flows out in how we do this publicly. That we think about it, that God presents us. He certainly does this. He is the one that would take us in front of it and says, hey, my banner over you is love that he would tell us that's who we are. Uh, he is a God who loves us and, and, and that love is defined by how he treats us. There's a sense that as we look at it in, in the way that it works in our world, uh, it is a space that he would long to communicate to us that, and again, it's powerful for us just to begin to get that understanding. But it's also how we speak of him, that that actually is effective even in our relationship with Jesus that there's this place of of, of honoring him, of speaking of his strength and tenderness. We're about to get to Malachi. We're going to start this on Sunday morning, not this Sunday, but next. And it's one of the issues that he deals with in there. Now, God's going to speak to them. He says, your words have been harsh against me. Like you talk about me in a way that's harsh, God says. You speak about me in a way that's harsh. And the people are like, what? How do we do that? How, how, do we, how, do we, how do we do that to you? And then God responds. He says, you have said it's useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? He says, I, I hear the way you talk about me. I, I, I hear what that is. And, and he's just going to just confront them on this kind of space that their that they're, they're very words cut against this thing. Make no mistake, even how we talk about that's key. In fact, I find myself thinking of Jesus who said, if you confess me before men, to the one who does that, him I'll confess before my Father who is in heaven. That's a great reality. He says, if you're here tonight, you don't know Jesus. He says, you'll confess me, then I will confess you. I will, I will, I will put my banner over you as love. I will, I will, you will, you'll be mine. But he says, if, if you deny me before men, if when it gets into the public, you're like, well, I don't want to let anybody know I'm really a Christian. Like, I, I mean, I'm okay kind of thinking, but just I'm not going to make it something that's a public profession. Then he says, I'll deny you. I'll deny you before my father. That, that Christianity doesn't work that way. This relationship with me can't be a hidden thing that nobody knows. It has to be on pub, in public or it's not real. And, and so he invites us into a place where that love would be where his banner is over us and we are speaking uh, words that would all together flow in the midst of that and that becomes great. But then we talked about getaways. Needed for marriage, but I think it's needed for us in Christ. I, I think it's needed for who we are and how that all plays out. Um, church can be a little bit like that. Can we just say that in some senses tonight is meant to be a date with God? I mean, it really can be, where you came to just 
worship him, speak some words, sing some songs. You want to hear his voice? It can be a part of that relationship. And you should have that daily kind of time with God. You should have spaces that you're just saying, God, I want to hear you. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to speak to you. I want to be known and I want to know you. I mean, it should be that way. But I find it to be powerful that in life there is really a space that I would encourage um, getaways with God. I have found them to be very important uh, in my Christian life. I found them to be very important that as much as my marriage needs it, my relationship with Jesus needs it. So honestly, probably two or three times a year, I will find a space. I will find a space. It's often uh, the kind of thing that what we just, you know, we think about finding that space is where it is. For me, it's often a retreat. It's like one of the men's retreats that's happening this coming Friday. Spaces where I get away, get away from the normal, get away from day-by-day things and get to a space of just saying, hey, God, I want to hear your voice. I want to hear you. And I find things like men's retreats or worship retreats. You know, we have one in July that usually is a whole church thing. We have spaces, and I have found for my soul, I need those. Um, Sometimes I just need to be pulled out of the day by day and and, and do it. In fact, again, if it's just being honest with you, it happens for me much like it does. If I can get one full day, if I can get up someplace and, you know, spend two nights somewhere and I can have a whole day that's just meant to hear God, that I'm not doing anything else. Like I'm not here for anything else but to worship and and, and pray and, and be in his word. And for, I mean, it's powerful in my life. And I found I need it. I find in the Old Testament that was part of God's plan, that three times a year you would have made your way from wherever you are to go to Jerusalem to to celebrate in the feasts. And I would find in a rhythm that would just be, hey, there's something about breaking away. There's something about disconnecting and and making everything about God. I would encourage you to find that uh, with an aim of saying, God, I just want to connect. I want to pray. I want to hear you. That's what I'm after. Like, I'm not after, you know, some goosey, you know, goosebump feelings. I'm just after communication. I'm going to hear you. I'm going to talk to you. And it's an aim of dealing with things while they're small. Like, God, is there, is there anything wrong? I mean, is, is my life, I mean, so much easier to deal with problems when they're little, even with God, where God can just, you know, in those moments be like, yeah, that. <laughs> like, okay, yeah, that's, that's true. You know, needed to hear that. It's a great space, and God has done that over and over in my life. And yet it does give space, even for that intimate connection with Him, that again, is this place of being His in the midst of it. In fact, I just go back to that, that we see this, and it ultimately is this picture of what we find in God, where we would come to Him and say, there's this space in my relationship with God, that He is my God, and I am His. And I have a relationship with Him that you can't, you can't be a part of. You have yours. You have a relationship with God, but he is so great. But there's this space where I find him to be everything, where I find him to be my life, and that's found. I mean, if you can see it, just glimpse it in marriage, I want to tell you it's so good to see it there and then realize God is longing for such connection with us that, again, in the overwhelming part of that, it is fully his, and he is ours. Uh, And just in the space of finding that to be our life in him. Well, we did that rather rapidly, but I think it was enough because we, we covered it. We got a picture of marriage. We got to see it in marriage. We got to see it in life in Christ. As we begin to close this evening, we're going to close in communion, which is one of those spaces that actually we get to do this, that we get to come and recognize the reason this is possible is because Jesus died on the cross. In fact, let me say this clearly. If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus, we love you. We're so glad you're here. But everything we've talked about and certainly we're talking about now is possible only because of Jesus, because he is that one that gave his life for us. In a moment, we're going to celebrate communion. That is a picture of his death and his blood that forgives our sins and brings us into a life. And if that's not you this evening, we're inviting you to Christ. We're inviting you into a relationship with him that is better than you've ever imagined. It's pictured in marriage, but it's so good. Uh, Inviting you to a real relationship with Jesus that we want you to have. So if you don't know him, come talk to us. We'd love to be a part of it. Surrender your life to him even now, if you do know him. We're going to end in communion. And again, part of it is words. Words spoken over you, words you speak to him. Places where we come right now to recognize his love for us, uh, his love so loving us that he gave us his son, that God's love is manifest to us in this. And so Wednesday nights, we do it a little bit different. I'm going to pray in just a moment. And after I'm done praying, the worship team is going to come up. They're going to lead in a couple of songs. 
the same moment. We're just going to place the communion elements up here on a couple of pillars, and then we're just going to invite you whenever you're ready. Whenever you're ready, you can make your way up here and take communion. You can take it in the first song. You can take it in the second song. You can grab that communion, take it back to your seats. You can stay up here at the stage. Uh, you can kneel. However it is, we're just inviting you to remember Christ and make it real personally uh, wherever you are, uh, that it would be a part of that. When you're done, you can continue worshiping with us. We also want to just let you know, if you're here this evening and you're gluten-free, uh, we have thought about you as well. So in the back uh, on the sound booth, we have some gluten-free uh, communion uh, wafers there for you. Uh, but because, again, we just want this to be something that you can fully participate in and known and loved by God and, and met by that because we want you to just have a space that we step towards this, we step into this to remember Christ and, and His love for us. So let me pray for that, and then we will just step into that. Again, you can take communion whenever you're ready in these next two songs. Father, we think about just getting a glimpse into a prescription, a menu of, of the ingredients that go into what real love looks like. And we've only seen a little bit this evening. Things we talked about last week, things we'll see again. But I recognize how needed these are. I want to pray for these marriages here this evening. I'm going to pray that you just form them and shape them into good marriages. That you'd shape their words, how they present each other, how they find space weekly, yearly, to connect, to grow, to grow deep. Lord, teach them. But Lord, in that, draw us to you so much more that we would know you that way, that we would connect with you in words, in reality, in spaces that would grow us in you. And I want that to happen right now as we take communion. We get a reminder of how much you love us how you have put a banner over us that we're loved, how you've rescued us. God, would you help us just to take part in this this evening in a way that is actually helpful in that, drawing us to know you better and, and what you have for us. Cleanse us now of anything that would hold us back from this. Draw us into it in your kindness and grace. We ask for it now in Jesus' name.